Genesis 26. Genesis 26, beginning at verse 12. I really will today kind of be tagging along with what was preached last week with regard to Isaac and Abraham, um, our Archbishop and Pastor Joe powerfully preached about the relationship of that father and son. And I just want to go a little further into Isaac's life um, to see what happened with him, being a descendant of such a great man of faith and power. And each of us here are descendants of great people of power. Power, perseverance. And so Genesis 26 Verse 12 through 25. I'll read it in your hearing from the NIV version. Here begins the reading of God's holy and eternal word. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued until he grew very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up filling them with earth or with dirt. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac and his herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he named the well Isaac because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one as well. So he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there, he went up to Beersheba. That night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. That's what they were singing about, calling on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. So far, the, script, the scripture really preaches itself. My topic for today for a few minutes is keep on digging. Keep on digging. Keep on digging. In this text, we find Isaac as the central figure. This is the same Isaac that was preached about last week that his father laid him on the altar as a grown man to sacrifice him. Yet he submitted himself to be sacrificed. It's so interesting that sometime when God will have us to do things uh, that we don't necessarily want to do, we never know what the outcome of those things will be. And Isaac submitted himself to his father, even though he did not understand what was going on. And I want to commend to each and every one of you that even when you don't understand what's going on and even when the task seems confusing that the Lord has laid before you, that you still submit and that you still obey because you don't know what's being birthed out of your obedience and commitment to God. God had promised Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. And that promise is still true to this very day. Isaac was born when Abraham was about 100 and his mother Sarah was about 90. 
But here at this point in the text, Isaac's mother has passed away. Isaac has married a woman by the name of Rebecca. His father, Abraham, has also passed away. He has had two sons. They were twins by the name of Esau and Jacob. And so here we stand in a moment where Isaac is moving forward in his life. And one of the things I want you to know about Isaac is there's not a lot mentioned about him in the book. He's almost like a middle figure to get you from Abraham over to Jacob. He's that middle person, but without him, we get no Jacob and we get no 12 tribes. So even if your story doesn't have as many chapters as Abraham or as Jacob or Joseph, it's still significant. Isaac is a very significant man in the scripture. He is a father of the faith. Not only that, he's a man of peace, as you can see in the text. He's a man of prosperity, as you can see in the text. And he is a man of principle, as you can see in the text. Now, this is why this is important. You can have prosperity with no principles and no peace. There's plenty of wealthy people in the world today that have a lot of money but have no principles. Have no peace. There's always chaos, always something going on around, always in the news, always this arrested, charged, this and that. Prosperity, but no peace and no principles. So my graduates and all those that are striving for greater, striving to be more, striving to do more, maintain peace. Maintain principles, ethics, morals, biblical standards, because that is truly the way that you will prosper. For when a man's ways please the Lord, he make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Fathers and mothers, I commend you that no matter what you give your children materially or physically, never forget to teach them daily how to build a relationship with God. For Abraham taught his son Isaac how to worship God. That worship meant sacrifice. It wasn't just something you do. It meant the very meaning of worship is to sacrifice. Whether it's you as a living sacrifice, your time, your talent, your treasure, your temple. Worship means sacrifice. We can wave our hands and sing some songs, but still not sacrifice. We can come into the building and still not sacrifice. Worship demands something from you. And it's usually something you don't want to give. That's what makes it a sacrifice. So Isaac knew how to serve the God of his father. But in this chapter, the God of his father becomes his God. Because the God of his father blesses him. Mama and daddy not here no more. I'm blessing you for you. And so he served the God of his father. He served and served and served. And God blessed him. The Lord appeared to him. I didn't read this part, but in verse two, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, walk with me and I will bless you. Don't move from this place. Stay here. Follow my instructions and I will bless you. And what happens as a result of Isaac's obedience? He is blessed, but he's not blessed without a struggle. And I want to park right there a little bit because sometimes we are struggling even though we're blessed. Sometimes we're walking according to the ways of the Lord. We're doing all we know how to do. We're working to be obedient. We're coming into the house. We're serving. We're loving our families. We're doing all the right things and checking all the boxes. Mostly nobody's perfect, but we're trying to do right. But there's still a struggle. Trying to hold on, but there's still a struggle. Trying to do what I've been taught to do, but there's still a struggle. And it seems like every time I'm making progress and trying to move forward in my life, I'm met with resistance. And sometimes I'm met with resentment. Because people see me progressing and they resent my progress. They see me going higher and they resent that they have not reached where they believe I've reached to. And they resent it. It's in their attitude, it's in their demeanor, it's in their jokes. That's really not a joke. It's always a truth and a joke. It's there. And so I want to encourage you, yes, you're blessed, but don't expect to be blessed without having to strive and struggle sometimes. It comes with the package. And sometimes we think because we're doing all the things we need to do to set ourselves up for success, we're going to school or we're going to trade school, we're learning things and making the right connections and meeting the right people. Isaac did all that. He was blessed, but he was still despised and envied. 
And I want to encourage you because maybe you've had to deal with people being jealous of you. Maybe you've had to deal with people talking about you behind your back. Maybe you had to deal with people putting roadblocks in your way because of what they believe God was doing in your life. And they thought maybe they deserved it more. Struggle. And some of you wonder why people have rejected you. Sometimes it's not you. Sometimes, like in the text, Abimelech saw how powerful Isaac was. Sometimes people see your power more than you see it. And that is why they reject you. And that is why they bully you. And that is why they make fun of you. And that's why they talk behind your back and try to put obstacles in your way. Because they see you for who you really are. And they see how blessed you are. And some people can't stand to see others blessed. It's just the selfish part of human nature. Some people will do all they can to manipulate. Do all they can to disrespect and dishonor what God has done in, through, and for you. But you got to keep on digging. When God decided to choose you, to bless you, to raise you up, it really didn't have anything to do with you. It was God's decision. It's not because you were so pretty, so perfect, so holy, so wonderful, so excellent. It's God's decision. So don't be mad at me. Be mad at God. I can't help that I'm blessed. You can't help that you're blessed. If you want blessings, talk to the same God that blessed me. Rather than fighting with me, worship God and see what God will do for you. It's a God thing. It's not a me thing. It's a God thing. But even blessed people, once again, are not exempt from struggle. And so in this text, we see Isaac is blessed and he's making progress and he's making his way in the world. And he's continuing in the ways of his father. Young people, when you have righteous parents, continue in the ways of your parents. I know sometimes they don't understand everything. Sometimes parents can be stubborn. And sometimes parents don't understand what the next generation is facing. Just like we don't understand all the things they had to face. And that's why intergenerational dialogue is so important. Because I'm in, in this age that I'm in, I can't say I understand what a 12-year-old is going through. That's why I have to listen when they speak. That's why I have to give them the floor sometimes to say, okay, I didn't have to go through that when I was in the seventh grade. But I hear you, and I'm with you, and I support you. This is why intergenerational conversation and connection is key. Not only that, but I want to highlight the fact that generational wealth is also important because here we see a descendant of a wealthy man Abraham was very very wealthy and generational blessings continued on even down to Isaac and we see that the enemy stopped up the wells that his father had dug and there are those that would try to stop generational wealth from being transferred to us but in the name of Jesus and by the power of God, we believe that whatever we accumulate in our lifetime will be passed to the next generation. Sidebar, for those of us that are getting up in age, let's make sure we handle our business right. So that the next generation doesn't have to struggle to do what they need to do for you. Struggle to bury you. Struggle to put a service together for you. Use the insurance money to have to put you in the ground. We don't want to go through that. Let's get a policy for that. Let's get another policy so that they can have something to move forward in life with. That's another sermon. That is not my sermon. But someone will preach that sermon at some point in time. Jay-Z said generational wealth, that's the key. My parents didn't have anything, so the shift started with me. And I took that to heart, 444, excellent album, excellent body of work, many lessons. I know some of y'all don't listen to rap, but that album right there is, a, is an album with many practical lessons and tools to advance your family. And I listened to it. Uh, habitually I would say all the time and I'm not ashamed to say that because there's lessons that people on that level know that I have not yet learned and so when you think about generational wealth some of you are the person that's going to shift your family in that direction you do not have to stay in poverty in your mind or in your wallet but there can be a shift from that place to a new place where God wants to bless you in verses 19 through 21 Isaac is digging. He's digging and digging and digging in the wilderness, in the desert, where water is precious and important. He's digging, and every time he gets in a flow, every time he finds water, someone contends with him to fight. 
Every time he gets in a good flow, every time he seems to be moving forward and progressing, someone raises up and says, no, that's mine. Isaac being a man of peace, okay. All right, it's yours. But don't be surprised, people of God, when you start making that headway and then here comes somebody. No, that's my idea. That's my promotion. That's my seat. Okay, but well, there's plenty of empty ones that if you, if you could find another one, I'm sure. But okay, but you got it. Because sometimes sometime it's time to fight, and sometimes it's time to say, you got it. You got it. Because there's room. And I think Isaac, being the child of a wealthy man, probably had the mindset to know there's room for all of us. At some point, there's room for all of us. I just got to find a place. So he's digging that first well. They raise up and say, that's ours. Digs again, finds another well. They raise up again. That's ours. You can't have it. You and your father get out of here with all that. The third time, he digs again. You see the persistence? You see the tenacity? COVID can't stop you. Disease and sickness can't stop you. Eviction can't stop you. Listen, don't let anything that come against you stop you from digging. He gets to that third place and he's digging and he's digging water and a flow comes again. And this time they don't strive with him anymore. This is his time to shine. This is his time to grab hold of the promise of God. And he called that place Rehoboth. Rehoboth, for God has made room for us. Not just me, but for us. God has made room for us. And so many times we're only focused on ourselves and what God is going to do for me and my, me, myself, and I. That's all I got in the end. That's what Beyonce said. But it's not about me, myself, and I. It's about us. How God is making room for each and every one of us. You and me, I ain't got to be jealous of you, and you ain't got to be jealous of me. I don't have to try to hold you back, and you don't have to try to hold me back. Because what God has for you is for you. What God has for me is for me, and what God has for us is for all of us. So when an enemy comes in, keep on digging. And when, and, and when um, opposition comes in, keep on digging. What do you need? You need a shovel. You need tools. When you're facing difficulty, you cannot fight in your own strength. This is a fight that God has to fight with and for you. And in the text, he promised Isaac, he said, I am with you. I will be with you. I will bless you. I will bless your descendants. Just keep digging. Don't get discouraged. Keep digging. You might have tried it before and it didn't work. Maybe the business closed down. Maybe you were earning your credits, but you never finished your degree and you got discouraged. You said, I'm too old to do it now and my mind don't work the way it used to. And, you know, I, I'm just, I don't know. Excuses. Get a shuttle, a shovel and start digging. You're not too old. It's not too late. You're not too young. It's not too early. You want to start a business? Start a business. 10 years old, 12 years old. You want to sell lemonade? You want to sell stickers? You want to sell t-shirts? You're not too young. You're not too old. God has a blessing with your name on it. Your name. And that means that the opposition of Bimelech and all his people, the Philistines, nobody and nothing anywhere can stop the blessing of God when your name is on it. The Lord is making room for us. We don't have to strive. We don't have to manipulate. We don't have to cheat. We don't have to lie. We don't have to put anybody down. Not even the other races of people can stop what God wants to do in, through, and for you. Don't even let the color of your skin make you afraid to go after more. And to go after greater because in God's eyes, you are beautiful. And he doesn't see white, black, red, yellow, and all of that. He sees when he looks at you. First of all, if you're saved, he sees the image of his son. And so I'm really talking to believers today, okay, because believers will never be defeated. I need you to understand that. Believers will never be defeated. I don't care what comes up against you. You will never be 
defeated. I don't care how crowded the job market is. I don't care how crowded your industry is. I don't care how crowded your city is or the black is or where you want to move or where you want to go. If God is making room for you, they're going to have to get out the way. Move, 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 move. Get out the way. Because here I come. And not only am I coming by, with me, but I'm coming with the strength of the Lord, the name of the Lord. And so you have to move out of my way. Isaac was a child of covenant. He kept covenant with his family and he kept covenant with God. Covenant keepers never have to worry about not being blessed. I'm going to say that again. Covenant keepers. Never have to worry about not being blessed. Because if I'm in covenant with God, God is going to always honor God's part of the deal. That's right. It's up to me to honor my part of the deal. Obey, walk according to my word, walk according to my ways. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's all he's asking of you. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's all he's asking of you. Keep your side of the covenant because God is going to keep God's side of the covenant. And no matter how blessed you become, how far you go, maybe some of you will be working in the White House one day. Maybe some of you will be traveling overseas, working in another country, have a business in another country, have a spouse in another. We don't know what God will do. Don't limit yourself. You serve a limitless God. Keep on digging. Keep on digging. In my conclusion, Kim, could you do me a favor? Can you pass me this um, envelope here? I didn't know that this had come to the church, but this is a great illustration to end this message. Um, because I've never limited myself. I know I'm black you know, from a distance, black, you know, I'm black, even if you see me from a distance, thank you, but I've never limited myself, I've always loved education, I've always loved to go and to travel, and my dad would tell you, first day of school, I cried to leave the school, that's how much I loved education from day one, I know that sounds weird to some people, but I really love school, not to be a professional student, but I love to learn, and I love knowledge, and I'm grateful for a, a father and a mother, who loved and believed in education. And the reason why I don't, um, even though degrees are important, my mom never earned a degree. So I'm always very sensitive to people who may say thank you. People who may feel like, oh, well, I don't have a degree. And, uh, no. Not having a degree doesn't mean you're not an intelligent person. It doesn't mean that you, maybe you didn't have time to finish. Maybe you didn't, maybe at that part of your life, college was not important or a priority, you know? And so, don't feel bad about anything. Always look at it and get inspired. Don't get jealous. Get inspired to say, if she can do it, God knows I can try and do it too. If he can do it, God knows I can do it too. And so this year, I wasn't here for like several weeks at a time. And I've been a part of a mentorship program for the last three years called Black Women in Ministry Thrive. And this mentorship program is under the auspices of a woman named Reverend Dr. Susan Johnson Cook. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she was a very um, famous pastor in the Baptist denomination. One of the, I think she might have been the first woman in her denomination to be a senior pastor. So she was mentored by men mostly because they were not allowing women to be pastors um, back there, and some still don't, but it's okay. You know, God is still blessing I, anyway. Not only was she a woman pastor, she was one of the first to be a woman chaplain for the NYPD. She started a service on Wall Street where a lot of city workers would come to this power, this kind of hour of power lunch. I'm talking about people all over the city that work downtown. You, Helen said she used to go. So her, we call her Sue J for short. She gained national attention for this ministry that she built in lower Manhattan from a church that they gave her that was failing, had like 10, 15 members, building was falling apart, you know, and they said, yeah, you be the pastor of that. That's what they did. But she turned that place around. That's why I said, keep digging. Don't let anybody limit you. They might give you the worst apartment, the worst cubicle, the worst, 
we're going to take it and make it work and watch what God do with the worst. Just like they used to give us the scraps and we created soul food. That's what we come from. You see what I'm saying? So anyway, back to my story. So I'm under the mentorship with Dr. Sujay. I was brought in with Bishop Lucas. So she's been mentoring me for the last few years. And so this week I was in Florida the whole week with these women. I'm talking about powerful women, man. Like millionaire women. Women get millions of dollars for their businesses. And I'm looking like, yo, how I'm here. You know what I mean? Not that I'm a grasshopper or anything. I'm just saying, yo, this is really crazy, like, that I'm in the room with these people. Like, Ambassador Sujay was, and she worked under President Clinton. She also worked for eight years under Obama as the ambassador for religious freedom. So she went around the world defending people's right to practice whatever religion they want to practice and not be killed and not be persecuted for it. Powerful woman of God. And I'm like, yo, I'm in this program with people like that from all over the country, you know, we're at this resort, and I'm like, what is going on here? Like, this is crazy. I could never have seen this for myself. And I say this to encourage you, take the limits off. Take the limit, you're not limited to Brooklyn. You're not limited to New York. You're not limited to the United States. Take the limits off. So I asked Kim to bring this up because in April, I was inducted into the Morehouse College Board of Preachers. And this is the picture that they sent me. Well, all these powerful people from all over the country, all over the world, and little Malene over here with her little black self. We all black for the most part, but little Malene right here on the front row. And I'm like, oh my God, look what God has done. I never wanted to preach. I never wanted to be a minister, but I obeyed God and I obeyed my father and my mother. And I want to encourage y'all. I know we don't always see eye to eye with our parents. We don't always see eye to eye with God either, but we don't always see eye to eye with our family, our parents, but keep on digging. Because you don't know what God is getting ready to do. Ruth, you may be educating people all over the world and helping them build systems and schools that will teach our children how to be better. And so that's my conclusion. Keep on digging because God has something greater for you. Don't care if you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. If you're four or five years old, there's more in store. Don't let the enemy talk you out of what could be potentially the greatest blessing of your life. Thank you because you don't feel qualified. You are enough. You are more than enough because God said you're more than enough. Yeah, you may be single. You may be waiting and dating. You're still more than enough. He or she will be blessed to have somebody like you. Don't let singlehood talk you out of because you've been single for a long time. Listen. God got the right one at the right time. I ain't worried about a thing. People ask me, when you get married? When I get married. That's a question for God. That ain't a question for me. Because God know I'm particular, okay? And I'm a lot. So when my time come, is when my time come. And I will be ever so grateful. Keep on digging. So I want to pray, number one, for anyone that may not be in the covenant with God. You might be watching online. You may not be in covenant with God. Right relationship. That's what covenant is. It's right relationship. Covenant means, I will, as Archbishop says, I will bleed to meet your need. Because when they used to make covenants, they used to make them in blood. And Jesus made a covenant on our behalf with the Father when he was on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood for our sins. That covenant can never be erased. That is a covenant that is eternal and everlasting and has granted us who believe everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That son came through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah. So if you're watching or if you're here online, here in person, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to raise your hand and we want to pray with you and for you. You've never acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you want to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you've backslid and said, you know, I was doing my own thing, but I need to come back and get in track, get on point with God. If that's you, just slip your hand up. 
We'll pray with you and for you. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. We all did this. We all came forward to acknowledge, God, I need you. I need you.